Kelly to my YouTube channel. Recorded. Sorry about that. Um, I would love to introduce Hello, Shelley thank to you. Hello and welcome to my channel, Shelly. I so appreciate you being here today. So I'm so curious because I haven't heard anything for, about your story yet. So general question is, how did the Jehovah's Witnesses come into your life? And yeah, I'll just let you take it from there. Okay, thank you so much. I'm very excited. Um, I was actually born into it. So it's all that I knew. And like literally from the age of like two years old up until I got disfellowshipped and I left, that's all I knew. And it's all I was in belief of that it was real. And I was in it, man. I was in it. Um, so from two till about, let's see, 15 was when I started kind of rebelling in the meetings and stuff and within the congregation. And then 16, I started getting like talks in the back and everything. And then 17, <clears throat> I kind of just separated myself a bit from the meetings and the congregation. And then 18, I got disfellowshipped. And, and then uh, I tried going back to like the memorial I'm, I'm a gonna, few times. I'm going to suck you then. Um, first of all, I want to know where are you located? <clears throat> what state are you located in? So I, I right now am in Texas, very deep Texas, but I was in the congregation and everything in California. At first I was born and raised in LA and we went to a LA meeting there and then we moved to a, a smaller town and then I was in that congregation but my whole youth basically. Uh, until I got started, and that was in uh, Central California. Okay, and is your whole family a witness, and where do you fall in the sibling category? So my whole family, my immediate family was witnesses, and then they actually turned to become witnesses from my paternal side. So my dad, his mom started going, got really into it, got him into it, and then he brought his whole family, it's what I grew up on, into it. Uh, my maternal side, they were not, um, they respected it from afar, but still accepted me. Like, they still got me Christmas presents and everything, even though my mom and family would be upset. And that's just my paternal side. They believe nothing of it. And then my grandfather on my paternal side, I feel like back then in the day, you know, it was a lot different. And my grandfather just kind of let my grandma do what she wanted to do. He's like, I don't believe that crap, but you do what you want to do, hun. <laughs> So that's how that came about. And and as you're um, telling the story, how old were you when you got disfellowshipped? Or I'm sorry, how old were you when you got baptized? I got, I got baptized at nine years old. Nine years old. Okay, so you were a very young kid getting baptized. What was the situation like when you were getting baptized? So I did ask for it because again, again I felt I growing. I was like the next step. And in my congregation, I was like one of the younger ones. There was maybe a handful of teens, five, six, seven, eight years older than me, that they would all kind of pick on me and make fun of me because like academically, I'm a good student. So like in the congregation too, I was just like a good student. So I would answer, I would participate, I would be involved, I would like want to help babysit when a baby was crying I would like go up to try and help and stuff you know like I was a very good kid so I just felt like the next step for me was to become baptized and then when you know you're going through all these questions because I am a nine-year-old and I know nothing nothing uh one thing I did know was that I wanted to become baptized because my goal actually when I was 18 was to go to Bethel and to like work in Bethel So you were you were baptized as a as a nine year old as a child, and your goal was to be in Bethel. Were you in in your family? Was your family known as a spiritual family? What was your situation like? I feel like yes, they 
were. I feel like in my parents' marriage, just like any marriage, there are ups and downs. And so I felt like my parents kind of had some ups and downs. But when it came to like being at the congregation, like you put on a happy face and you're there. And so, um, yeah, it was like my dad wanted to be a lot more involved in it. And I don't know. I think he almost just like couldn't get there yet. I don't know. But he would make us, you know, we went to all the book studies, we went to all the little meetings, all the side things. Like he even wanted, you know, to do a book study at our house and everything. And so, yeah, I think we were pretty good amongst the congregation setting. And, and you mentioned your father. Was your father a servant or did your mom, was a pioneer? Were there any other um, things that your, your parents were doing in the congregation? So, so my dad wasn't baptized until he was like maybe <clears throat> 35, maybe like in his like late 30s. That's when he was baptized. And then from there, maybe maybe that was my inspiration to want to get baptized too as young. And then my mom got baptized, I think, uh, you know what? I think actually my mom got baptized before my dad did. I'm just kind of like reminiscing now, but I'm pretty sure he, you know, towards the end, my father had deceased. Towards the end, I kind of think that he kind of knew it was a cult. So I feel like towards the end, he was kind of trying to separate himself from it. You you mentioned toward the end. What, did it, what are you referring to? Uh, my father passed away at 41 in 2005. And like, oh God, just like that much of me just feels like it was the congregation, you know, like it was, I don't know. So just, just towards the end of his life. So, so talk to me a little bit about that toward the end of his life. How old were you? He was 41. How old were you when he passed? Um, so he passed. I was, I just turned 15. He just turned 41. I had just turned 15. And that is when, uh, literally everything started changing. So this is what happened was <clears throat> my grandfather and grandmother, they had a great life. They had great money and everything. And like I said, my grandpa wasn't really into it, but he was like, you know what? If you want to do it you to my grandma, go do what you want to do. So he wouldn't let her like donate a bunch of money, but she would donate some money. And then my dad, I feel like he just looks up to his parents. So he's just kind of like following in their footsteps, doing what they want to do because they're financially secure and living a good life. So why wouldn't we want to as well, his family? So my grandfather died. And then six months later, my father passed. And so while all this is happening, as I know, um, death is natural for like elderly, but I couldn't understand like why my father was passing at 41. And it ended up being like a diabetic heart attack. And so that was very eye-opening for me because I didn't know. It was almost like I was like following a plan. Like you go to the meetings, you get baptized, you study, you go work here, you pine, da, 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 da. Like, and you just like very planned out. So this just like hit me like a ton of bricks where I was like, what is happening here? Why didn't anyone tell me about this? Like, I just was in so much shock. And then... Uh, my grandmother, she kind of went into a depression and so did my mom. So I feel like all the witnesses were kind of rallying around her, trying to be like, well, this is too much property for you. You should give it to this person. This is too much for you. Oh, they have enough inheritance. You should put us in power of attorney. So between 15 and 17, I questioned a lot because they weren't like, are you okay? this hap, da, 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 da. They just like came in and like started doing business. So I feel like I was never able to even like grieve properly because that's just, I feel like not how it was done there. So 15 through 17, I'm like rebelling because bills are coming in. 
the witnesses are not helping us, even though we're doing everything that by the book that we're supposed to do. So I'm like, my mother is just crazy depressed. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to go to work so I can help pay the bills. So I start working, paying bills and everything. Well, then it's almost like the witnesses are checking on me at work. Like I was working at like McDonald's and like a foster freeze. You know, I was like washing dogs in the morning. I had two jobs, washing dogs in the morning and then going on to like my part-time McDonald's or foster freeze job. So they would come by and check on me just to make sure I was doing okay. And I was just getting a little annoyed because they're like, oh, you missed the Sunday meeting. I'm like, well, I had a shift. Well, you need to be working your shift around that. And I'm getting annoyed because I'm like, I need to provide for my family because you guys are not helping me. So this is what I'm going to do. And again, this is just eye opening to me at about 16 right now to where now I'm 17 and they're just kind of like you need to do this or, or you're going to get in trouble. And I was like, I'm so overwhelmed right now. I am trying my, like they're breaking me at this point. So I feel like when a teenage girl at that gets to that point, you do one to two things. You're either going to give up and go with the church or you're about to rebel and go do your own thing. And that's what was happening was I just said, F it, rebelled, when did my own thing. I didn't care if, people saw me drinking. I mean, and this is like 17 too. I just wanted, to, I was just so overwhelmed and just very too young to be feeling and having the responsibility that I'm having. So I just did not care. I was, let's go drink. Let's go smoke some pot. Let's go to the river. Let's go party. Let's go. Oh, this guy's cute. Da, da, da. I didn't care if these witnesses were seeing me now because now say something. Are you paying my bills? No. So that's the type of attitude I was getting. And then finally at 18, they were like, you have a choice. You can either choose this worldly boyfriend or you can be disfellowshipped. And I was trying to reason with them. I'm like, hey, look, I'm going through all this. Let me mention to you too, as I'm going to this meeting where they're about to disfellowship me, there is like six old elders that have watched me grow up, that I have babysat their children, that they, the fathers themselves should see just this sad little girl, you know, she just needs a little guidance. So here they are just berating me and talking crap to me. So I'm like, hey, in the scriptures, doesn't it say you're supposed to open them with welcome arms? Why not help my boyfriend see the truth and help me? And maybe we, he, I can bring him into it. And they were like, no, no, no. Like they did not want me to bring this worldly boyfriend into the meeting and turn him, you know? So I said, forget you guys then. So I chose my boyfriend, got disfellowshipped, and literally moved out of my mom's house within like a two-day span. And when I got disfellowshipped, my mom disfellowshipped me too, even though she needed me to help with the bills. And I accepted that. And like when I would take her grocery shopping, we would see a witness, like I'm one time and my husband has heard this story numerous times. We're in the bread aisle. I'm asking my mom, hey, what kind of bread do you want? I look over, see a witness come into the aisle. I see her like lock eyes with me, lock with my mom. I turn around, my mom's left me. And I'm like, are you kidding me? So now I'm just getting angry at this point. I'm feeling used by my own mother because now she is shunning me. And she is like literally she's disfellowship me as well geez this is this is breaking my heart you were so young doing doing all of this paying helping pay the bills helping your family you and your mom survive she's shunning you at the grocery store you're still so young did you graduate high school did you take a vocational school or did you what what happened i mean you were so young and all of this happened seems really overwhelming you're working two jobs what, what was um I'm, I'm sorry i'm asking you so many questions at the same time but what was um the life like uh, with the with schooling and, and graduation if, if you can start there because you were again you were so young and you're working so many jobs yeah definitely. so i went to regular school 
until I was a freshman. <clears throat> and then my freshman year, I literally had like all advanced classes. Like I was so bored and I was still very much into the congregation and wanting to move up there. So I was like, hey, convince my parents, put me on home studies. Then I can graduate sooner Then I can pioneer because I wanted to be a full-time auxiliary pioneer too. Like, and they were for it. They said, cool, yeah, let's put you on home studies. So I was on home studies and I actually graduated like a year and a half early. So I graduated in 2007 when I was 16 still. Um, so from there, uh, I was at work full time then after that because I could either go to college, which one I couldn't afford. And like, I didn't know how like FAFSA worked in financial aid because no one's taught me any of this. So I was like, I can't afford to go to college. Or two, I need to obviously help my parents, my mom, with all these bills. So and I went to work. <clears throat> Being so young with so much responsibility, and you said the congregation was not there at all for you. I, I give you credit for even still going to the meetings time during that time after your father passed away it also seems like he passed away pretty sudden it wasn't like he was sick and then he died is that correct yeah very sudden it was on uh, like december 23rd and even though like we don't celebrate holidays like christmas is really hard for me because that's all i think of is like one like hearing uh my mom like crying to my older brother like, what do we do? So I'm thinking, cause my grandpa just passed like six or eight months ago. So I'm like, oh, now my grandma's passed. Like, this is normal, no big deal. You know, I'm just like preparing myself for it as I'm like laying in bed, hearing this. And then when I get up and I see like, it's my father, uh, I'm just so confused. I'm just so confused and lost. And my mom doesn't even call 911 at first. She calls the elders. The elders come to the house and then they call 911. And then obviously, like, it's too late. The dude's dead. And, like, they don't try to, like, nothing because he has a damn DNR. He's a damn witness. <laughs> so <it's, laughs> that was rough. That that was rough. So I wasn't ready for that. I'm sorry if I went off topic right now. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. no, no. Fantastic. Thank you so much for being so vulnerable with, with me and with the people that are watching this video. Then you, you got disfellowshipped at, at 18 years old. You're living with this boyfriend, I presume, for a while, and your mom is shamming you. So what is what is your life after that like? So then, yeah, it just gets bad. I just become a straight worldly person that doesn't care if witnesses see me or not, like, I'm just like, say something to me. They're not going to though. So I'm working at this Asian restaurant and I'm working there full time. I'm 18, 19 years old, uh, disfellowship still. And this is a very popular restaurant where all the witnesses go after lunch on Sundays. So every time they would come in, I'm like the hostess and the waitress, you know, I'm doing everything. They're just like giving me dirty looks. You know, I can tell they're all talking crap about me and everything. And I'm just like staying professional because I'm like, you don't pay my bills. It's cool. I'm not going to wait your table. I'm going to give you to someone else because you're not going to tip me anyways. Boom, boom. I just keep it super professional because I'm just like, it's almost like I have no choice. So even though in the workplace, I'm being professional in my personal life with this boyfriend, I'm doing what I want to do. I don't care. And what I want to do is just numb myself. And that sounds terrible. That is what, it's almost like I want to feel something. I want to feel something and nothing at the same time. And so I would drink, I would smoke, we would party, get into fights. Uh, I was just a terrible person after that <laughs> for a while there, for a while there, until I finally realized um, I just needed like a change of view. I've just been in this little town for so, so long. I need to go get, get away, go do something. So when I was 20, uh, me and him both, we went up to work up at Yellowstone National Park uh, for a season. And then from there, we were just going to go on to other places or just see where life took us. Who knows? We might have just came back home after that season. But it, it was just to go do something. And you get to go live up there. So I was just, like, excited to explore. And 
just like see other life, other culture, you know, like meet people. <laughs> like I've been so enclosed and he was a terrible boyfriend too. You know, like I didn't have friends with him or nothing. So that really escalated really quickly. It's like being controlled by combination. Now I'm being controlled by this man. Oh, but I'm so brainwashed because I'm supposed to like, the man is supposed to be the man of the house. Even though I'm paying my mother's bills and I'm helping him pay his bills too, which he's living at home with his family. Uh, I was just like brainwashed from the congregation still that it like, you know, tumbled over into personal uh, worldly life too. And that was terrible for a while as well. Did you say you were still paying your mother's bill, even though she was disowning you and you were helping with your boyfriend? What what was that like for you? A thousand percent. That's that's exactly what I said. And that's it's just like I just like to help people. I just want to help people. I just want to like be involved. I just want to like make everything, I guess, easier for other people because I want it easier. It's almost like karma. If you do something for them, and I don't want it to be like I only do it to get something back. Because that's what that guy used to tell me. Oh, you're only doing this so you can get this. And I was like, no, I'm actually doing this out of like the kindness of my heart. But it's, um, I don't know, it's almost like I'm a provider. I'm my father's daughter. That's what he did. That's what, you know, that's just in my blood. I'm just like a provider, a problem solver. You need something, I can figure out how to do it. I got it. Like, so it was just like me playing, I guess, like my role. Did your mom work at all or was she... Not able to work? Um, yeah, she, she she did not work at all. I felt like she was just like crazy depressed. And I didn't even know what that was back then or if it was real or anything. And she just like couldn't. She just like lay in bed sad for like months. So I, I feel bad for her. You know, even though she's treating me like this, like now I'm feeling bad for her. So, yeah, I just, like, am a problem solver. I have so much compassion for you, Shelly. I know. I feel, like, so dumb. But, like, I've never, you know. I'm sorry. You're, you're not dumb. Because I've recovered so much from it. So, thank you. I think it takes so much uh, of yourself that you shut off to provide for your mom and to care for her. And your people pleasing mentality of just like you said, wanting to be that provider that your dad was for her, and that you shut your childhood completely off. And I mean, you were a child providing for your mom, so it was a lot of years that you lost for yourself, which is years that you can never mm -hmm. have again. I have, I have so much compassion for you for those for those years. Um, and at 20 years old, uh, you mentioned you moved to Yellow Park, uh, Yellowstone with your with your boyfriend, your ex boyfriend, and at the time, um, what what mm -hmm. happened after what happened after that? You were still providing for your mom and and uh, also taking care of your your boyfriend's family. What happened after that? Yeah, so we ended up there, um, basically, honestly, to like sober up because we just been like drinking constantly getting into fights like our relationship was getting terrible so we basically went up there to like work up there sober up and just kind of like try and be a healthy couple and uh so we went out there and I was I was sending money back to my mom and then uh, my grandfather had actually moved up to where my mom lives like in his own place so he was there to try and comfort her even though he was not of the witnesses at all but he was like there for her so he is a grandfather he's a you know much older gentleman he was getting sick so my mom then started caring for him so he started paying my mom so when i'm up there it's almost like now my grandpa is taking care of my mom but she's getting out of that she's becoming more of herself she's like taking him to a doctor's appointments taking him to grocery stores they're going out to lunch together like they're going you know to like the casino for the weekend because my grandfather loved the casino you know so she would take him up there but I could tell you know she's like 
smiling and laughing a little bit more. So when we moved up there, I sent money back a few times. And then I was like, hey, man, I don't know what we're going to do after this. So you're going to just kind of have to figure it out. And she was not even worried about it because, like, my grandpa was already handled, taking care of her. And mind you, the bills were not bad at all. We owned the house. So all you have to pay is property tax once a year. All you got to pay is electricity. All you got to pay, like literally, I mean, it was maybe like a thousand dollars a month to pay for everything. So it was, you know, my grandfather was basically paying that for her. And then we went up to Yellowstone um, and the relationship just got a lot worse. And after the season ended, uh, we ended up going to Colorado because my boyfriend at the time his family was living in Colorado like his cousins so we went over there after like we rode a bus <laughs> down after our season was over down there and uh, they're growing marijuana and they're doing great so we're gonna grow marijuana and do great as well so here I am you know 21 years old now Alan Colorado and uh when we first got there, we were living in like a room that literally had, uh, what's it called? Like not saran wrap, tin foil. This room had tin foil all over it because they had a bunch of plants in there with lighting and stuff. So I slept on the couch six, seven, eight months. Like we slept on the couch eight months. We were just like, selling weed, growing weed, moving weed. Uh, and I was just getting bored with it because again, I feel like I'm just like a doer to where I'm like, Hey, I need to make more cash. So I work at like the Arby's. There's like an Arby's literally right in front of where we work. So I go and work at the Arby's, um, that they all, we all get kicked out of that house because the smell is so strong. And we're like in a little like duplex community. So the smell is so strong. We get out of there. So we have to move to Commerce City, which already smells like crap constantly there. And then it just got bad. Like we got our own room finally because now I'm paying rent there. <laughs> I'm paying rent there now. And uh, we get a room, we have nothing. You know, we're sleeping on the floor the next year or two. And it's just terrible. This dude don't want to work, just wants to go and like drive around and sell some weed and that's fine, but you're not making any real money. Like I have, you know, like three, four, five hundred dollars on me at a time, not like 40 bucks every two days. So that was rough because I'm like, hey, we need more money. So I went and worked there. And again, I feel like I just it's just cycling again. Like just like my mom, he was just like, I don't want to work. I can't work. So I'm like, all right, I'm just going to fix this. And I'm just going to go to work. So I started working there. And then I started nannying on the side too. Like, I just like to stay busy too. Like, what else am I doing during the day? And then from nannying, we went to, I had a job there at the Broncos Stadium in Denver. And I went there and it was a very nice uh, event they were having. And uh, there was catering going on there. So I'm looking and I'm like, dang, how is this woman get this job here? Like, how would you, you know, I would, I would be great at this. So I literally asked her, I'm like, Hey, if I would want to get a job like this, like, how would I go about it? She literally gives me a phone number. Hey, call her the season's about to start, you know, like with all the football going on and everything, like we're going to need people. We're going to need a team. Perfect. I call this woman. She does not even like, I go in for an interview. She, 45 minutes. She was finally like, all right, you're hired. Like, I don't even need you to say anything else like you've talked your whole <laughs> interview like you are hired and then from there I was like oh this is great this was a badass job like this was my favorite job ever so we were struggling down at the weed house where pipes were breaking during the winter because it would freeze over um lights would burn up and then the timing would like there was just always something happening so I was telling my roommates, hey, you guys should come and work with me here. Like, this is an amazing, I get to work concerts. Like, this is so, we get to bring food home afterwards. Like, dude, this is great. 
and none of them wanted to. And even my boyfriend, I was like, hey, you can come work a few with me, like come work, like this will be fun, you know, like I'm already moving up in here, this is great. And he just didn't want to. So now I'm getting annoyed with him feeling like he's using me. And then he's like getting mad, like, why are you coming home at 3 a.m.? Well, the event ended at 12. We had to do inventory. We had to put everything away. Like, it's a 45-minute drive. I'm sorry. So now accusations start coming. So after a few six, seven, eight months of accusations, random, as I'm bringing in food for everybody, money for rent and everything else, if we need extra lights that are $1,000, I'm, I'm about to help you guys come up with a way to make this money real quick so we can do this. I'm just, again, like a problem solver. And so accusations start coming. So now I'm just getting annoyed with this guy. And I'm like, I'm just going to go hang out with this girl that I know. That when I, when I was first 15 and my dad died, I was so intertwined with the religion and the congregation and everything. They allowed me to go to Colorado from California six months after my dad died for one month with another to go stay with like this other Jehovah's Witness 20 something year old that I've never met in my life. But I'm going with one of my best friends in the congregation. And if you're in the congregation and intertwined in it, like it's all good. Like whatever you say goes, oh, we're going here. Okay, you're going with so-and-so, have fun. Like it wasn't even a question. So when I went there at 15, I met this woman and then I met this littler girl. This girl is like, I'm 15 at the time. She's probably like 12, 13, maybe, maybe 11, 12, 13. Well, they're drinking, they're drinking, they're going out, they're like running the streets of Denver, just like, this was so freeing for me too, because I was like, I wanted to drink. I've just gone through all this stuff with my dad dying six months prior. I'm in this new state where this witness, she don't care what she's doing. She's probably, and you know, she's probably cheating on her husband anyways, but she's taking us little girls out. We're just roaming the streets and everything. So I wanted to drink, but it was almost like I was afraid of drinking. Like I was afraid of the getting buzzed part of it. And that was the same when I first started smoking pot. Like I didn't want to, like I wanted to look cool smoking it with cigarettes. So I wanted to look cool, but I didn't want to actually inhale it because I was like terrified of getting high or, you know, getting the nicotine. Like I was, so I was chilling with them when I was 15 and we became really close with the little girl. So we stay there a month. We go back to California a month later and we keep in contact with the girls from Colorado. So flash forward to when I'm living in Colorado now at Denver, working, having this great job, trying to be like, hey, come with me. So I'm getting so annoyed because I have no other friends there. And he's like, you know, stuff. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go hang out with this girl that I know because she's the only other person that I know. And my ex-boyfriend at the time, he knew about me being a witness. He knew about how strict it was and everything. So when I told him I'm going to go hang out with this friend over here, um, she's of the same religion. He was like, okay, go have fun. So I went and I got drunk, a little bit too drunk. And then uh, I ended up sleeping with someone else that night. <laughs> and I was terrified, terrified the next day to go home because I was going home to tell him. Like, I just had to be honest. I, just, I couldn't, I can't keep a secret or nothing like that. So I was terrified. Uh, when I got in my car the next day, I like drove off a little bit and like cried for a long time. I was terrified. I knew he was going to like beat the crap out of me. Like I was like, dude, I'm dead. He's, he's probably going to beat the crap out of me to where like he kills me right now. So I was terrified to go home and everything and tell him. And I finally mustered up the courage to go home, but I didn't tell him for a bit. And then uh, I started seeing the guy that I slept with actually. Like, in secret, like everything that my ex-boyfriend was accusing me of doing, now I'm doing it. Because it's almost like you pushed me to it. And I feel bad saying that. But that's how I felt at that time. So, my bad, but that's, that's how I felt at that time. So, I'm seeing this guy. And uh, he is, I'm very honest with him, too, about it. I told him. I was with this other dude, 
but he could tell that that dude, you know, was like abusive to me. And he's such a gentleman. He was like, I'll help you get out of it. Like, we'll figure something out. Like I was, I fell in love with this guy for like what true love was. It wasn't just like being with someone be like, oh, I love you. It was like, I fell in love with this guy. So I dated him like secretly for like six months and everything. And then uh, finally I slipped up somehow and that dude found out my boyfriend and he didn't even want to break up with me because he was depending on me. It was crazy. He was so abusive, but it, I don't know. I don't know why I stuck with him. I don't know. Cause I was living like with his family and everything, but I'm paying bills. I don't know. It was a crazy time. So yeah, then we ended up getting kicked out of, Oh, that, that dude that I was seeing, he actually wanted me to be his girlfriend. And I was like, man, I, I can't, I can't be doing all of this. Like, this is crazy. But I said yes, because I didn't want to stop hanging out with him because I just enjoyed his company so much. Two days later, he breaks up with me. Don't, I mean, it's fine. It's whatever. But I tell him because I'm such a problem solver. Hey, we don't have to be boyfriend and girlfriend. I just like hanging out with you. Like, I just feel so comfortable around you. Like, is it cool if I just, like, come chill up at the pool with you for a drink every now and then, you know? And uh, then we just kept hanging out. We just got back to where we were without the titles of it, just hanging out. And then the dude's family that we were living with, he was like, hey, I'm tired of you guys. Like, they were all on drugs, too, I'm sure. I'm tired of you guys. You guys have to get out. So he kicked us out. So literally two weeks later, I would go tell this other dude that I've been hanging out with, hey, nice to meet you. Thank you so much. Like, you've taught me genuine care for me, and I appreciate it. Like, you've taught me, like, how a man should be treating a woman. Thank you so much. Um, you'll never see me again, though. Like, I got to go back home. I got kicked out. Like, I was almost like in a fantasy world there. It was crazy. So we're on a bus back to California from Colorado together sitting there and it's like the worst 35 hours ever just like depressed sad scared anger like you could just feel it off of him just because he's asking me all these questions like what were you doing da, 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 da. it's just like blah, blah. so I'm getting upset I'm telling him what was up I'm telling him that da, da, da. I'm telling him and this dude still like he doesn't want to leave me so he's like we'll figure it out when we get back to town we'll figure it out and I'm just like dude just give me some space, man. I need some space. So we get back into town and I tell him, this is how desperate I am. I'm going back to my mom's house. You can go to your family's house. And I went to my mom's house and it was, it was just weird. It was weird. I stayed there maybe two or three nights and then I ended up going to live with my grandpa because I just didn't feel, I just felt like she was just always watching me, just always like judging me, just always like looking at me in disgust, like didn't want to talk to me, just, I just felt disgusting. So I went to live with my grandpa and my grandpa, he's cool. You want to have to come have a beer with me, come have dinner? Like, why don't you go out and have some drinks with your friends? Like they can pick you up. Oh man, I love living with grandpa. <laughs> and then... That dude would just, uh, my ex-boyfriend, he would just find out where I was working and he would just like pop up. And so like he manipulated me <laughs> to get back with him. So I got back with my abusive ex-boyfriend again. And that lasted a little bit. And then I started getting really sad and depressed and just really overwhelmed and suicidal and everyone around me could see that but my boyfriend at the time my mom and my brothers could not see that and that's what I was getting depressed from so it was the like came back into town um started working and everything and now, like, my grandpa got my mom on a cell phone plan, so now my mom needs help with the cell phone bill. Because he tells my mom, gives my mom responsibility, like, hey, you have to at least be doing this. I can give you this money, but you have to at least be trying to do this. 
So now I just literally fall back into like helping pay my mom's bills, even though I'm staying like at my grandpa's house and everything. So that was really hard just to like fall back into it, go back into it. And then I get back with this boyfriend and then we both just decide like, let's just move into my mom's house because this is our house. Like this is my house. Like the, no, no offense, no offense, but this isn't my mom's house. This is mine and my brother's house. So if I'm paying the bills, I'm about to come in here and we're about to switch some things up because my mom every day, she would literally get up and go and take care of my grandpa for 10 hours a day. So she wasn't even in the house. So I'm like, no, she's not even like sleeping in a room anyway. She's sleeping on the couch. So I'm going to come in here. I'm going to fix this house up and we're going to, you know, like start living like, like you're going to have to accept it or not. I put Christmas tree up. I put lights. She, she started coming out of her shell too, because that's how she grew up. She grew up worldly as well doing it. Holidays are fun. You know, and when you grow up doing all of this and you have children and now your husband is like, we're not doing this no more. That takes a little bit of you because I'm a mother now and I love holidays and I love celebrating with my kid and I love encourage. I just love seeing and being there. So she's starting to come out of her shell a little bit. Like it's almost like she's forced to, but she like wants to as well. So, you know, she would like we would get her a Christmas present and I would get her birthday presents and I would get her like a birthday cake. And the same with my brothers, I would get them stuff too. Just cause I was like, screw it. This is what I want to do. Like, this is who I am. I'm sorry. I'm paying the bills here. This is what's happening. And my, both my brothers, they didn't care about it at all. They were like, screw the religion. I'm doing my own thing. Like they were never baptized or nothing. They were never into it really. They like, I feel like the congregation kind of focused more on me probably because I got baptized super early. So uh, super depressed, super sad, taking literally like nine to 10 Vicodin a day. Like I'm trying to kill myself. I'm trying. I am praying at night. I hope I fall asleep and don't wake up. I am so excited to take these pills and go to sleep tonight because I want everlasting rest. I was just so drained of the world. And then one day I get a Facebook message and it's from a dude I was chilling with in Colorado. Hit me up, said, you know, like, hey, started talking to him again. Two weeks later, I am on a plane running away to Texas where I am now. And I've been here since for eight years and I love my life but I did have to run away I did it was in secret only one person knew the one that was taking me to the airport and it it was very planned it was like three days where I had give her a little bit of clothes at a time so she could put it all in a bag for me so like he like my boyfriend there wouldn't notice like stuff was missing and I got a uh, yeah like even like my mom and all of them, they didn't know where I was going. They thought I was going to work. Everyone thought I was going to work that day and I never came home. And then I wasn't, I, I didn't, I was just like, I'm done with, I'm done with everybody here. I'm just done with everybody. But then like, I felt bad because they were like calling the police, like thinking, you know, something's wrong with me or I've been kidnapped or something. So I had to finally, I contacted my brothers and my grandpa because I would rather talk to them. Then my mom, just to let them know, like, hey, I'm cool, but this is where I'm at, and this is where I'm going to be at. I'm not coming home, so y'all are just going to have to deal with it now. And I sobered up, and uh, I'm a healthy person now. <laughs> I'm a healthy, normal person now with my own business, and I do my own thing, you know, and got my own shop, and yeah, it's been a very eye-opening. But, but I just wanted to say, I just wanted to say I do think I started to believe in fate a little bit because this is a big theory that I have is if my father never passed away, I would have never went to Colorado where I met that little girl, where when I was back in Colorado, I would go to hang out with her. If I didn't hang out with her that one and first night, I would not have slept with this guy and met my future husband. <laughs> I feel like that is some type of fate.
<laughs> like it almost got me out. Like I almost had to go through all of that to realize and then like to get out of it and just to be like in a very healthy marriage, very healthy, like state of mind, everything. I have several questions for you. So it, first of all, yes. is your mom still a witness? She is half and half. She, I don't know if you, I'm sure you've seen like a, like a Pimo, you know, like physically in, mentally out. She'll like go. Yeah. yeah. Okay. She goes, she'll go on service, but she'll, you know, hit me up on my birthday now. She does holidays. Uh, like when she, like she came and stayed with me for six months actually, because I wanted to give her the opportunity to know her grandson because I feel guilt for her too. I'm like, dang, she's been brainwashed too. She's been like, trying to give her like grace too over this, like again, out of the goodness of my heart. So she came and stayed with me for six months and, you know, she's like trying to throw a birthday party for my son, you know? And I'm like, dang, there was a lot taken from her too. So I have to, you know, like be forgiving in a way. And eight years so she, ago, <laughs> physically, I was like she's, she's yeah, eight, I get eight, it. Eight, she's, when you moved to Texas eight years ago, why did you have to sneak away? Was there something that was happening that made you have to sneak away? Oh yeah, they wouldn't let me. I tried breaking up with that boyfriend a handful of times in the past six months. I was like. I tried breaking up with him. I tried. We were living in my mom's house. I tried kicking him out of my mother's house, like our house. And I could not get rid of him. Like no one would help me. Nobody. They would see the abuse and then just be like, oh, well, that's just like how your relationship is. It was crazy. It was. So, yeah, I just had to because he he would he would have he would have kept me there. He would not have left me. And it would have been worse. I would have been a prisoner even more in that house with him there. And the same thing with um, my mom and them. I'm, I'm so sorry, but I feel like my mom is such a negative person too. It's it's almost like if I didn't do that for myself, I I wouldn't have done it at all. So I did it for myself. Oh, good for you. And then you you said you were in a healthy, happy marriage now. So talk about that a little bit. Like where did you guys meet? And I know you said you have your own business and I'd love to hear about that too. But first I'd love to hear where you met your husband. I met him in Colorado. That's the dude I slept with <laughs> that one night, that one night that I slept with and kept hanging out with him like that. This is him where I said, you know, uh, like, thank you so much for like genuinely caring about me. Thank you so much for like showing me how a man should treat a woman and everything like that. Yeah. He, he hit me up on Facebook and I moved out here to be with him. Cause I was like, wow, this guy, he was so good to me out there for such a short period of time. I was looking for an escape and he reached out and I grabbed on and it worked out. Like we're both super easygoing people and we're just like very honest with each other too. Amazing. Well, that makes me so happy. Very, very beautiful ending or where you are. Um, and you, you said you own your own business. Do you want to talk about that for a little bit? Yeah, definitely. That's where I'm at. I, we, um, own a small pet grooming shop here in East Texas, pet grooming and boarding. Um, I do toddler size water slides and balance house rentals as well. Um, and that's literally like what our life revolves around. And that's, yeah, that's what we do now. And we have a son together and he's like the best. He's the best. It sounds to me like you've been an entrepreneur at a very young age and you were, like you said, you're a problem solver, which is fantastic. Um, I think there, you have so many strengths that have come through with all the trauma that you've been through. So I, I commend you so much and, and the woman that you, that you are. Now. Uh, thank you so much for this absolutely amazing, super vulnerable interview Shelly um is there anything that you feel like you would like to add to this video or to any ex-witnesses or witnesses that are watching this physically and mentally out vice versa um that you want to add to this video yeah I do think um growing up as a witness I have excellent morals 
I, I went, you know, I went through a bad period of time, but I have good morals. You know, I'm a, a loyal wife. I'm a loyal person. I'm a hardworking person. I believe in myself. And I just think if more people had the opportunity to believe in themselves and to really go for things, you know, like we did, we started this business from the ground up, just believing in myself, coming to work every day, not having someone be like, oh, well, you have to do this, da, da, da. It was like, we are doing this. So I just appreciate, I do appreciate my upbringing because I want my son to have the same type of morals too, you know, how to treat women and everything too. And I just want, I don't know. I feel like if you believe in yourself and you truly want to do something, I believe you should go for it and do it. I've done a lot of bad things though, you know, so, but I'm learning, learning, just learn and grow from your mistakes, I guess. And you are loved. And you know, I do want to say, I actually have a much stronger relationship with God. I, I am a spiritual person. I feel like going through all of this, throughout every single period, I have always prayed to God. And it has been, help me, guide me. And I do feel like that is important as well. So I feel like today, I, I thank God all the time. You know, like, thank you so much for my mental state. Thank you so much for giving me these hands and the motivation to go to work, to make money. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to provide for my family. Like, and that's, you know, how prayers, I was raised on those prayers. So I feel like that has helped me so much too. And I do think that is very important because I do very much so uh, believe in God. Not necessarily, I don't want to be like not Jehovah, you know, but I do believe in a God and a higher power. And I feel very spiritually connected as well. Much more than I ever did in that church. I love you. I love that you said that. I feel the same way. And I think uh, that there is so much more than just God in a religion. God with with something bigger than us is, is how I how I see it. Anything bigger than you. And in looking to that as just like being grateful. You you can't look outside and not realize that there's not something bigger than just us. Um and it's uh, again, I, I just want to say thank you so much for all of your words of wisdom, your encouragement to help people go for whatever it is that they want to, whatever it is that they want to. It's like start somewhere and then you never know what will come from uh, uh, from all of this. Um, so again, I want to say uh, thank you so much for for coming on here, for sharing your story. And if you want to contact Shelly, I'm going to leave her Facebook contact in the description box. And thank you again, Shelly, for this incredible interview. I so appreciate it. Hey.